and welcome to the podcast of the History Teachers Association of New South Wales. My name is Jonathan Dallymore and you are listening to the second of two episodes in which I had the privilege to talk with Professor Stephen Hodkinson from the University of Nottingham in England about the history of Sparta. Because I introduced Professor Hodkinson in the previous episode, I'd like to keep this part of the podcast brief. But before I begin, I'd like to thank Stephen for making time for this during his recent trip to Australia. And I'd also like to thank Academy Travel for sponsoring his visit. Without their support, it'd be very difficult for HGA New South Wales to get international speakers of this calibre. And I'd like to recognise their contribution here to the history teaching community of New South Wales and beyond. Lastly, just before I begin the interview, Stephen is gathering evidence for an impact case study that is currently underway at his former university in Nottingham. And he's asking for teachers who have used his publications to provide a brief statement of how his work has helped to teaching and also the learning of their students. If you'd like to contribute, I'm going to provide the details of how you can make a submission at the end of this interview. If you have benefited from Stephen's research, as I know many teachers in Australia have, can I encourage you to take the time to make a submission as a small gesture of your appreciation for his research in this area. As always, thank you for joining us on the podcast, and I hope you enjoy this second interview with Stephen Hodkinson. Hi, Stephen. Welcome back. It's good to be back. (laughs) Last episode, we were talking a lot about particular aspects of Sparta. So we covered things like the military, we covered um, the role of Spartan women, helots, and so on. I wondered if you could start this episode by giving us your summary of Spartan society that is not the mirage according to you? Well, um, Sparta is a society that has uh, has a large uh, territory occupying um, the whole southern half of the peninsula of the Peloponnese. Um, the people we call the Spartans, uh, the Spartiates, the, the, the ruling group, uh, all live in Sparta itself, uh, sharing a, uh, a common lifestyle. Um, in the rest of Spartan territory, there are the Peroikoi, who live in communities scattered around the territory. Um, they're, they're free men, communities like, like any other Greek, Greek city-state. Um, and then the Helots, um, they uh, farm all the lands. And there are also a certain number of Helots who are in personal service to the Spartans, who work in Spartan households, uh, who act as uh, batmen, um, personal attendants, when Spartans go go out on campaign, they carry all the the equipment uh, for, for, for the uh, um, for the for the Spartan uh, uh, soldiers. Now, um, let's focus in on Spartiate society, uh, the, that of the elite group. Um, as I mentioned in the last episode, there is this common lifestyle, um, which um, is similar for both rich and poor, and that's the key to the um, the unity of, of the Spartiates. But um, it's quite a diverse lifestyle, uh, lots of time for private leisure. Um, Spartans are able to engage in all the range of leisure pursuits that um, elite Greeks in, in other, other states would, would, would engage in. And um, Spartan women participate in, in, in this um, uh, lifestyle um, to a certain extent. The, the girls uh, have their, their, their outdoors uh, upbringing, um, uh, training in, in running and wrestling and so on. Um, they have a crucial role as uh, mothers um, uh, in reproducing the Spartan population and they um, effectively have control of, of the households. Uh, and so women are h- highly regarded in Sparta and p- play a critical role. And as I mentioned, they're major landowners and therefore a, a, a significant force in, in, in the society. And so overall, we can imagine that, that Spar- Spartan lifestyle is, is um, um, although it's very group-centred, um, it's not um, totally controlled on, on a, in, a, in, a, in a micromanaged uh, uh, way. And um, it would have been regarded and was regarded by many Greeks elsewhere as an ideal lifestyle, um, where, the, where the citizens um, didn't have to work for their living and, and, and could um, spend their time on, on, the, on their private affairs and their public duties. And, and the only thing, other thing I would say is that um, in balancing the public and the private elements, 
Um, the ancient sources coming from outside focused very much on the civic duties that the Spartans have to perform, including the military duties. Um, but recent research has shown how important um, uh, private wealth and property were and how Spartan families had the same interests as Greeks in, in other cities about um, um, becoming wealthy, um, getting on, enabling their children to make uh, advantageous uh, marriages and the like. And that this is what leads to the ultimate collapse of the Spartan system in the early 4th century. Um, the principle is that every Spartan has enough land to be able to uh, live a life of leisure with the produce being supplied by the helots. But there's evidence for um, increasing concentration of land in a few hands, um, rich marrying rich and the poor getting pushed out. And certain increasing numbers of poorer Spartans get to a level where their estates are no longer large enough to um, sustain their way of life. And in particular, um, a crucial criterion for being a citizen is being able to provide a fixed monthly amount of produce to the common messes, the Sicitia, in which they, they ate their evening meal. If you fail to make your contributions, you um, cease to be a member of a Sicitian, and if you cease to be a member of a Sicitian, you automatically lost Spartan citizenship. Um, and so in the late 5th and the early 4th centuries BC, um, the number of Spartiate citizens actually declines, not so much through demographic uh, decline, but b because of this, this indirect property qualification for being a member of the group. And there develops a, a body of men who are known as inferiors or hupermines, to use the Greek term. Um, and Kinodone, who makes the conspiracy that I referred to a couple of times in the previous uh, uh, episode, uh, he may well have been one of, one of these inferiors who who uh, tries to lead a conspiracy um, to, uh, to to remedy the fact that uh, he's regarded as a man of great personal qualities, but he he lacks the status, the economic status, to be a proper Spartiate. One thing we didn't get a chance to discuss specifically, I know you brought it up a few times in the last episode, but we didn't really get a chance to discuss it as a distinct issue, is the role of archaeology in our understanding of Sparta. And you refer a lot to the literary texts, and obviously they're crucial to our understanding, but you did mention a few times archaeology, so I wonder if you could just give us a, a bit of an, a sort of snapshot of, of what archaeology has done to our understanding of Sparta. Well, um, the contribution of archaeology um, has been limited by the by several factors. Um, first of all, um, the Spartans themselves didn't build many grandiose monuments. Um, Thucydides says um, in Book One of his History that uh, um, if future if future generations uh, viewed the ruins of Sparta they would, wouldn't realise how powerful Sparta was uh, be, be because of the comparative paucity of, of grandiose monuments. And he says that, in contrast, if you viewed the ruins of Athens, you'd think Athens was far greater than, the, uh, than, than it really was. So there's that um, uh, limitation. Um, also the fact that um, um, Sparta itself was um, uh, ransacked and destroyed um, by... Um, um, in late antiquity, in the 6th century BC, by, by Slavic invasions, and the, the site was deserted. And then when the new city of Sparta was built in 1834, following Greek independence, um, it was partly built over the ancient city, um, particularly over the, the, uh, the southern part of the ancient city. So um, for all these reasons, um, the amount of Spartan archaeology has been quite limited, However, um, there has been some uh, quite a lot of work done on Spartan sanctuaries. Uh, I mentioned the sanctuary of Artemis Orthia um, uh, earlier, and um, the rich deposits found uh, from the archaic period um, are, are, are highly informative. Um, there's also been um, intensive 
um, a survey of um, two parts of Spartan territory. Um, this is an intensive survey involves teams of field walkers um, walking systematically across blocks of rural territory um, and looking for um, mainly potsherds, but any artefact in principle that has been brought up to the surface by um, mo modern deep ploughing of the land. And that provides a way of understanding what's going on in the countryside, not, not just in, in, in urban areas. And there have been two surveys in particular. Um, one, um, the uh, Laconia survey, uh, which surveyed an area um, quite close to Sparta itself, to the, um, to the east and, and slightly to the north of, of Sparta. And that was led by uh, my Nottingham colleague, uh, Bill Kavanagh, um, um, working with the British School uh, at Athens. And then an American sur survey, the, the Pylos Regional Archaeological Project, in which I took part myself in, in one of the, the seasons of their work, um, right out uh, at the most um, extreme part, western part of uh, Spartan territory, uh, near the, uh, the uh, uh, Mycenaean site of Pylos. And um, what was interesting about these two surveys is that they produced remarkably different results. The pattern of human activity, as found by uh, scatters of potsherds in the landscape, in the Laconia survey area, um, there were, there were um, small scatters dispersed around um, much of the um, 70 square kilometres that the survey a area covered. Um, and the archaeologists interpreted this as there being many small settlements, um, individual farmsteads, small hamlets, perhaps occasional uh, villas, um, and lots of, of, of shrines around. Um, in contrast, in the, the Pylos area, there were relatively few um, sure scatters found for the archaic and classical periods, but they tended to be much more concentrated. In fact, um, one, um, the one sure scatter was covered a, in the classical period a area of between 15 and 27 hectares, a really quite large territory. And, and this was almost certainly a uh, quite a sizable village. Um, now, there is a little bit of uncertainty about who the inhabitants were in these different areas. Um, I myself think that for the most part we're dealing with areas farmed by the helots. But it, it, it can't be excluded that some of the areas there might have been periodically living there. But um, I think the better interpretation is that uh, this gives evidence for the, the helot um, patterns of habitation, which I, I mentioned um, in, 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 the, in the earlier episode. Um, close to Sparta, um, they're dispersed in, in, into small communities, which can be quite easily supervised by Spartiates going out to their, their, their estates and, and, uh, and, and farming them. Um, and in fact, in the, in the, um, the area of the Laconia survey, very close to Sparta, um, the uh, sites seem to lack um, um, evidence of, um, of, of storage vessels, um, implying that the produce from the uh, nearby lands is actually not being stored uh, in those uh, farmsteads, but is being taken by the Spartiates back to, to, to Sparta itself. Um, whereas in Messenia, um, in the Pylos area, one can, one can Im imagine, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, self-organising helot communities who, who, who are running their own affairs uh, on, on a on a on a on a day to day basis. Um, so that provides you know, unusual insight into the nature of the, of the life of the helot slaves, um, which is you know often we're very in the dark about how how slavery operated in in, in ancient Greece, and this is, this is particularly good evidence for one particular um, slave population. Um, Another key um, element of um, archaeology that's worth mentioning is um, the wide dispersal of Laconian-made artefacts around the Mediterranean and, in fact, in, into northern Europe. And particularly in the 6th century BC, um, Laconian pottery uh, is dispersed um, very widely in the Mediterranean, um, in 
Asia Minor, particularly in just off the coast at Samos in North, North Africa, um, in particular at Cyrene, uh, and over in the Western Mediterranean in, in Italy and, 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 and even, even further afield. Um, it's evidence that, um, um, that artifacts being made in Laconia are, are um, much in demand elsewhere, um, and this, this may be perioikoi who, who, are, who are engaged in, in this trade. Um, but also um, there are artefacts pertaining to, to, to the Spartiates themselves that find themselves uh, um, elsewhere. Um, there's a particular, um, a really nice little um, uh, bronze lion. Um, he, he, he's, he's sort of uh, sitting down um, and he was found in the sanctuary of Hera uh, uh, in, on the island of Samos. And he bears a little uh, lovely inscription on the, the ruff around the, the lion's neck. And, it's, and the inscription reads, uh, Eumnastos um, Aspartiate to Hera. In other words, um, uh, I, Eumnastos, uh, I'm Aspartiate, and I dedicate this, this, this object to, to Hera. Now, um, it's a little bronze lion, but um, it's clear from the artefact that it was not a... Um, a freestanding statuette, but it would have adorned a much larger bronze vessel. Uh, it would have adorned the rim, and, and we have exam other, other examples of, of this too. Um, so Eumnastos um, has taken this large bronze vessel right across the Aegean to, uh, to Samos, uh, dedicated it. Um, he's probably been visiting a foreign guest friend, um, a lot of link between the Spartans and the Samians. Um, and the case of Eumnastos um, um, alerts us to the fact that um, a notable aspect of Laconian bronze manufacture in the 6th century BC was these large bronze vessels. Um, uh, some of them were hydras, um, um, water containers, others were, were craters for mixing wine and water. Um, and they've been found not just in the Mediterranean, but um, in many parts of Central Europe, um, and in particular, the most famous one is the, the Vix Crater, um, found in the tomb of a Celtic princess uh, in central France. And um, it's um, a magnificently well-preserved uh, bronze crater. It stands almost human height. And it's, uh, you can visit the museum at chatillon sur seine in central France. Um, and um, we see on it um, very rich decoration. Um, we have uh, bronze hoplite warriors marching around the uh, um, the band just below the rim, um, but the handles are, are adorned with, with with snakes sort of uh, c c curling up and down the handles, um, and it's a example uh, of the very rich bronze manufacture that sixth century Sparta engaged in, and the fact that Sparta is not uh, isolated from the wider world. It has links across the Mediterranean and has links up, up into, into Central Europe. I'd like to switch over now to talk to you about how Sparta has been appropriated. And we, we did discuss this at the beginning of last episode where you sort of talked about the different ways people have represented Sparta over time. But I want to, I guess, focus in more on the contemporary world. And actually, interestingly, uh, I've passed this on to you now, but in 2015, I took a photograph at a at a big event in, in Martin Place in Sydney, actually. I just went along as an observer because I, I saw this group, um, you know, presenting some pretty wild ideas. And I like photography, so I thought I'd go along and try to document the event as well as I could. And one of the images that I came away with was a group of about four or five guys dressed up as what, you know, obviously was attempting to be Spartan warriors, um, which at the time struck me as a very odd thing to see in Martin Place at a at a political rally like this. This is a group called Reclaim Australia. It was much about um, immigration and issues like this. Since talking to you, you sort of put this in much bigger context for me about the uses of Sparta by modern political groups. And I just wondered if you could flesh that out a bit. Yes, you're right. The, um, um, the example of the uh, demonstration in Sydney that you showed me the image of, uh, um, it rang a lot of bells for... Uh, for images that I've seen um, in many other parts of the world, um, in parts of Europe, particularly in Greece with the, the Golden Dawn movement, who uh, have adopted the Spartans as, as their ancient model, and um, they, they often equate um, 
the immigrants into Greece with the helots and and glorify in, in the fact that they want to treat um, uh, immigrants in, 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 in the same way as the Spartans, you know, treated the, the helots the, the, the very brutally. Um, and Golden Dawn um, holds uh, rallies uh, annually at Thermopylae, um, uh, celebrating uh, the macho militaristic aspects of Spartan culture. Um, and there are um, what's known as the identitarian movements in other parts of Europe, uh, right-wing groups, uh, who adopt Spartan symbols, the, uh, the lambda, the, 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 the up upturned um, L uh, on, on the Spartan shields, um, um, and um, Spartan-style he helmets. Um, and, but above all, uh, it's in the United States that uh, we see the most vivid and uh, recurring uh, use of this kind of I imagery. Um, and it seems to be very heavily stimulated by the myth of Thermopylae, uh, the, uh, the self-sacrifice of the 300 Spartans, um, and above all stimulated by the film 300, Zack Snyder's 2006 film, which was based upon the, uh, the graphic novel of Frank Miller um, of 1998. And um, Miller himself... Um, got the idea of writing 300 from the film The 300 Spartans of 1962, the, the great Hollywood blockbuster. Um, so there's a continuity there, and the continuity of ideas is that the Spartans were willing to sacrifice themselves for freedom, you know, defending Greece from the, the Persian uh, in, in invasions. Um, and this has been taken up by far-right groups, um, particularly in the USA, um, you know, objecting to, uh, to 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 immigrants um, uh, coming in 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 into the United States, and um, uh, spoiling the, um, the 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 white culture that the far right groups like to def de um, to defend. And so, um, at a number of far right demonstrations, and the most famous here is the um, um, protests in the Californian um, University town of Berkeley. Uh, in April 2017, where there were counter demonstrations between um, far right groups, uh, particularly a group called the Oath Keepers and uh, and, and anti fascist uh, groups, um, and uh, a lot of the, the far right groups were um, wearing um, Spartan style helmets, and they were uh, uh, bearing uh, the lambda, um, and also they were particularly flaunting. Um, a phrase, a, a supposed Spartan phrase, molon labe, um, which translates roughly as uh, come and, and take them, which is the phrase supposedly um, spoken by Leonidas at Thermopylae when King Xerxes um, allegedly um, told the Spartans to lay down their arms, come and take them. Now, just to dive verge briefly onto the historical reality of, of this phrase, um, it's very uncertain. Uh, it appears only in one late source in, uh, in Plutarch's uh, uh, Spartan sayings. And it's not actually uh, a Jared Butler 300 uh, shouty type response. It's actually part of an exchange of letters between Xerxes and Leonidas. Um, so, um, and um, whether it's authentic or not is very uncertain. Um, it's very it's certainly authentic that the Persians often communicated by by, by letter rather than by uh, by, by, by verbal uh, messages via heralds, um, but the Spartans would have been more used to, to, to giving verbal responses. Um, but anyway, um, whether it's authentic or, uh, which it, um, or whether it's a later invention, it certainly was never shouted out uh, by Leonidas in a defiant way. But the the, the far right um, uses. The actions of the 300 as you know the ultimate you know defiant response to uh, a, a, an external threat um the far right link it of course to um to um the um, islamic threat um islam and the persians being being sort of uh, um put together um and uh, the threat of iran um and it's also been linked in with internal politics too. 
um, as part of um, President Trump's uh, uh, campaign for the presidency in 2016, um, there, were, there were far right groups who would superimpose uh, Donald Trump um, in front of the, the 300 and um, make comments like, you know, we, we stand with, with you, Trump, uh, against Obama and the, uh, the Persian Muslim uh, hordes. Get Obama, Hillary, and the Persian Muslim uh, hordes. So um, there are groups who are, you know, very keen to use this imagery to promote um, uh, uh, right-wing politicians in, inside the the, the, uh, uh, the USA. Um, and this group that I mentioned earlier, the Oath Keepers, um, last year announced what uh, they call Spartan training uh, groups. Um, programs where they will um, use um, ex-army and police personnel to train um, like-minded civilians in, 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 into a, a sort of a, a, a paramilitary force. Um, and, and they say on their website that this force will be um, available to patriotic governors um, who want to defend the Constitution uh, or to President Trump, um, should, should he ever, ever feel, feel the need for uh, uh, for, uh, for military support. Um, so quite frightening uh, uh, and, and extreme uh, appropriations of the Spartan ideals. Um, and this comes on top of the long-standing use of the, this phrase modern lobby by the, um, the gun lobby in the USA. Um, the it's part of their rallying cry, cry against any attempt to restrict the uh, uh, ownership or usage of arms, you know, come and take them. And so if you're a gun lobby supporter, you can buy all sorts of apparel um, from, from, um, from, from, um, from cartridges to, um, to items of, of, of clothing, sort of uh, caps, um, or, or, or T-shirts or, or, or women's blouses, which have this, this Molo and Labet Labet phrase. Um, and um, this has been taken up by certain commercial firms who, who put this on, the, on their manufacturers. And in particular, the, um, the arms manufacturer, Sig Sauer, has produced um, a, a 1911 uh, handgun, which they, um, um, they call the Spartan. And it has uh, has the Molin Labbe uh, phrase sort of prom uh, prominently um, blazoned on, on the on, on, on the barrel of the, of, of, of the handgun. So um, some 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 quite uh, you know, frightening uh, appropriations, which make it all the more imperative for we Spartan historians to put across the image of the real Sparta to, to counter the, the, these these misuses. And, and as strange as obviously those examples are to us, um, particularly probably in Australia and Britain where gun laws are very different and, and whatnot, but, but even our own examples from Australia, they seem quite extreme. But, but as you said in the first lecture, oh, sorry, the first episode of this, lots of different political groups have picked up this part of thing and abused it for whatever reason they have. So it's not actually a new development in any way with with how people have appropriated Sparta? It's not new in that sense. Um, it is perhaps, well, with the exception of Nazi Germany, it's new in the um, the, the far-right appropriation of, of, of Sparta. Um, because historically, um, Sparta has, has been as much appropriated by what we would you know, might loosely call the left. Um, it's been seen as a quasi-communist uh, uh, ideal because of, of its shared way of life um, and because of um, misinformed ideas that the Spartans uh, didn't have private property um, uh, that, 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 that's been a, an important sort of um, socialist sort of um, 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 perception of Sparta um, and, and so you know, Sparta it has almost been over history whatever you want it to be you can portray Sparta in extreme militaristic terms, which appeals to the right, or you can portray it in very, 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 very socialist communitarian um, uh, terms. Um, you can portray it uh, as a very simple society that, that appear, uh, appeals to those who um, uh, want to oppose luxury and greed, um, or, 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 you, or you, can, you can use it to 
um, promote um, monarchy because we want to have two kings. Um, and this is you know, part of the endless fascination of studying Sparta, not just the ancient city, but, 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 the, but the, 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 the modern the uses of Sparta. Um, but you know, they, they have some, some really quite serious aspects to them. Perhaps we could talk about a positive or a more positive example to finish then, and that is this project called, the book's called Three, I believe. Ah, yes. Yeah, so the graphic novel that you, I think, were involved with in some sort of consultancy way. Could you just want to tell us about that project? Yes, uh, very gladly. I got the opportunity um, back in 2013 to be historical consultant to um, a famous British graphic novelist, uh, Kieran Gillen, who had worked on a wide variety of uh, different kinds of uh, graphic novels. Um, but he had the idea for writing a graphic novel about Sparta. And the stimulus for do- his doing so was... Um, the way he tells the story was that he came home one evening after drinking with a group of mates and um, you know, got home, sort of slouched on his sofa, couldn't have the energy to quite get to bed, um, um, picked up a, um, a graphic novel from, from his shelf and it happened to be 300, Frank Miller's 300. Um, and he started reading this uh, with all the comments about Spartan defending freedom and so on. And his immediate response was, but you guys, you hunted slaves, you know, the crypte, you, 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 you hunted and killed helots. Um, and he was inspired to write a graphic novel, which you might describe in academic terms as subaltern, looking at Sparta from the point of view of its helots, slaves, uh, rather than from the view of, of the Spartans. Um, so he called it Three. And the three are three helots, uh, two male helots and a female helot. Um, and without uh, spoiling the, the novel uh, too much, um, um, they um, uh, they kill a Spartan effer and they have to go on the run. And they're pursued by the 300 Spartiates and uh, they have their own Thermopylae style resistance at, at, at the very end. So he's turning that popular narrative on its head in a way and trying to bring out some of those other aspects of the story. Yes, that, that's right. Um, uh, imagining what life would have been like for the helots um, uh, and you know, their perception of uh, Spartan brutality, um, but also, um, also undermining the Spartan militaristic myth in a different way um, by setting the story not in Sparta's heyday um, around Thermopylae and afterwards but in the year 364 BC um, which is after Sparta's defeat at the Battle of Lutra in 371 when Sparta uh, um, has lost control of Messenia um, and therefore only controls her home territory of of Laconia Um, and um, Spartan manpower is much reduced as I mentioned earlier um, and they f- they fear further attacks, and therefore, um, Gillen is trying to indicate how Sparta, you know, how Sparta's military focus had, to what depths it eventually led, um, and um, he said that um, he started the novel being very anti-Spartan, you know, wanted to portray the helots' reaction to um, the Spartan brutality, but uh, as he wrote it he began to see things a bit more from the spartan angle um not in the sense of um portraying them in any positive way but of seeing them as trapped within their own situation where they had this hell of population they had to control they had this military reputation they had to live up to um and this had led them into uh, overextending themselves in their imperial um control and their imperial hegemony in the early fourth century and it had brought them to quite a low condition where they were they, they were trapped within their own ideology. Now, you, um, you may and quite rightly get the impression for this that the work doesn't entirely depart from the image of the Spartans as, as militaristic, um, um, a militaristic people, and that's because um, although Gillen had um, read a lot of the recent research, even before I, I personally came on board as consultant. Um, and he was aware of the new interpretations. 
he felt that to make the, the graphic novel intelligible to a mass audience, it couldn't be too divorced from the, the, the standard image as in 300. Um, um, so um, he, he retains um, that aspect of, 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 of the, the Spartan mirage, as I would see it, uh, but it, but turns it on its head to show how it, uh, it fails in the end. But um, he does incorporate a lot of um, more authentic aspects of Spartan life. He has a, uh, um, a fictional um, woman who's a large landowner um, and who um, has a, uh, a team of chariot horses that she's about to enter at Olympia um, and... Um, and various other aspects of Spartan life are depicted in, in a more r realistic way. Um, um, and a lot of this was already in um, Gillen's mind at the time that I chanced to come on board. Um, um, I have a colleague at Nottingham, uh, Lynn Fotheringham, uh, who um, has close contacts within the graphic novel industry. And she already knew Gillen. And uh, um, one evening over dinner, he said, I'm... I'm you know, um, about to write a uh, graphic novel on Sparta, and he said, "Well, I know just the the person who can be your consultant." <laughs> um, so that's how I came on board, and um, it was a fascinating experience. In that, um, uh, Kieran would, would send me. Um, it was originally five uh, monthly episodes that came out in in, in small sort of um, more comics, um, and he'd send me each episode, and I would read through the text and check for historical accuracy and uh, any. Um, aspects where I thought the recent research might, might uh, add an extra dimension to, to the story. Um, and then I'd send them back and we'd, we'd, ha we'd have quite an interesting to and fro uh, by, by, by email. Um, and he was quite willing to make adjustments as, as long as you know, the basic story did, did, didn't also, which, which wasn't a problem. Um, and um, um, I even got to see some of the um, the sketches for the, uh, um, for the story um, at an early stage and occasionally was able to make one or two corrections so one of the early um, sketches uh, uh, done, done marvellously but by an American uh, uh, Ryan Kelly um, when, the, when the Spartans first appear on the scene they're in the 300 style um, leather sort of uh, 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 trunks and uh, otherwise naked and I, I, um, Ryan very graciously totally redrew re that, that page showing the Spartans in more authentic sort of uh, clothing and so on. Um, um, so, you know, um, it, it was very interesting to be able to, to um, engage with both images and text. And, and uh, um, it was one of the more interesting experiences of my academic career, should we say. Um, and then regarding the colours too, um, uh, we had this very interesting debate about how to depict statues because of course most people's image of Greek statues is you know pure white marble and so on. The recent research suggests that Greek statues are probably very highly coloured, uh, very gaudy colours, reds and blues and purples and, and, and so on. Um, and uh, the colourist uh, Geordie Belair, um, she um, was quite keen to be authentic but was concerned about possible negative reactions from a an audience who who wasn't used to sort of seeing colour statues, so we, we compromised a bit on that. Um, the statues we made mainly largely naked, but in a kind of flesh colour rather than pure white, and with occasional bits of colour for for, for, for belts and and, and 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 similar similar apparel. Um, so um, it was an interesting set of um, uh, compromises and adjustments that we made um, to meet both mass expectations but also to insert some, some of the historical research and uh, I think that the the slightly coloured statues got some of the the more extreme reactions that uh, 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 of all the sort of the reactions but we, we, we imagine we might get more reactions from the uh, the, the changes of uh, historical interpretation but uh, people seem to take those on board quite easily uh, but the, 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 the coloured statues <laughs> um, were, were a bit beyond the pale for some people. Stephen, this has been a great uh, conversation again, and I really thank you for coming in and taking the time to talk to us. Um, you've got a couple more weeks in Australia, so wish you all the best for the rest of your stay and the other lectures you're doing. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. It's my first visit to Australia. I, I'm enjoying myself uh, thoroughly and uh, meeting lots of academic colleagues and, and getting to know uh, uh, 
some lovely rural parts of, uh, of Australia too. So, so thank you, Jonathan, and it's been, been my, my pleasure to, uh, to do this podcast. As I mentioned at the start of the episode, the University of Nottingham is currently preparing an impact case study for Stephen's former department looking at the wider impact of their scholars' research. To help them gather evidence for this study, Stephen is asking anyone who has used his research in their teaching or coursework to contact him and provide a brief statement of how his publications have helped their teaching or their students' learning. If you'd like to help Stephen with this study, there are three important specifications for your submission. Firstly, you need to email Stephen using your work email address and provide your statement, which can be made within the body of an email or as a Word or PDF attachment. Secondly, the period of the study is focusing on the 1st of August 2013 to the 31st of July 2020, so your comments need to relate specifically to this period of your teaching and your use of Stephen's work. Thirdly, the specific research material Stephen is seeking feedback on relates only to the work that he developed and published while employed at the University of Nottingham, and that was between 2003 and 2018. So please make reference only to publications he made during that period. To submit your statement, please email Stephen directly at stephen.hodkinson at nottingham.ac.uk. That's S-T-E-P-H-E-N dot H-O-D-K-I-N-S-O-N at nottingham.ac.uk. Lastly, Stephen would like me to pass on his gratitude to anyone who's already submitted to this and also to those who are planning to do so. So on his behalf, thank you very much. Thank you.